All right, folks, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to this month's Datacom community webcast. Uh, before I hand you off to Kevin Schuma, just a few things I need to cover. Um, first, a few questions along the way, and we always hope that you do. Please use the questions box along the right-hand side of your screen under the GoToWebinar control panel. We'll get through as many of those questions as we have time for today. If for some reason we can't get to everything, um, I'll make sure that the team gets your contact information so they can follow up with you. Uh, we are recording today's session. Replay will be available out in the Datacom community probably sometime either this afternoon or tomorrow morning. So if you have colleagues you want to share that with or if you want to watch it again, please just go out to the community. It'll be out there for you. And the last thing for me is that we always want to make sure these sessions are valuable. So with that in mind, I pulled together a quick survey that will pop up at the end of the webcast. If you could stick around for you know a minute or so and give us some feedback, I know everyone involved would appreciate it. That's it for me. Take it away, Kevin. Thank you, Len. Welcome, everybody, and welcome to today's presentation on Datacom's multi-user startup options. So this is going to be a little different from your normal startup option presentation. Uh, I wanted to give folks a chance to think about startup options more as functional options and how they could be grouped together to make sure that we have the right um, settings and that we are paying attention to them. So today's presentation is going to be a little bit different than what you've probably seen in the past. Um, so as always, with the disclaimer here, this information is the best information we have available as of December 8, 2022. Um, we're giving you all the information we can, but as always, something could change in the future that would uh, change some of the information that we're presenting. So as I said earlier, the purpose of this presentation is to provide an organized way to try to view the startup options that we have presented and provided to you. Um, I want to also cover some specific areas where I think you should be reviewing your startup options often. Uh, one of the things that I find, and I do quite a few um, site reviews and so forth, is that people tend not to change their startup options, even though there's been significant change in applications or in workload running through a given multi-user. And the reason they tend not to change those options is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, what could happen is it's not going to break. In most cases, Datacom is very, very stable. It's not going to break on you. But it could slow down because you're not adjusting the parameters in the environment to meet the workload that you're currently throwing at it. And the other thing is I want to make sure that you understand this presentation is not a replacement for the product documentation. You know, we work very hard to keep the product documentation up to date to the current form. And a presentation like this will live on for years and may present parameters or other settings that are no longer valid or have changed in their value. Um, so please make sure that you're always referring to our product documentation to get the current information on the uh, options that we're talking about for starting up the multi-user. And there's a link there to presentation that kind of provides that. You can also just go out to the Datacom tech site, uh, the Broadcom technical doc site for Datacom and one of the tricks I always use is I type in a startup option like EXCTLNO and just search on that. And it always takes me right to where the options are because that word doesn't occur in a lot of places in the doc. So with that, the agenda we're going to work on here is the purpose of startup options. Um, I'm going to go through the groupings that I call load change. These are the things that pretty much once you set up, you most likely won't be making changes unless you're making some change in the way that your environment is going to be working, you know, you're adding SQL processing or something like that. So these first few groupings I'll call low change. Basically, we, I would ask you to go through and verify these groupings against your current options and make sure you are specifying uh, all the options that we recommend. But once you have them set up, you're probably good to go. And then we're going to talk about the groupings that we change more often, the ones that I typically, when I go on site uh, with anyone, I'll go through a calculation or review on. And that's the buffer pools that we have within Datacom and the virtual covered uh, caching areas. And then finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about a proposal of where we should go with the startup options. And, you know, kind of have you guys get uh, feedback on that. Please send me an email, Kevin Schuma at broadcom.com. Um, because we would like to start looking at how can we make startup options something that is better for you and easier for you to manage. And then we'll go into Q&A.
So kicking off, we're going to go into those groupings of load change. So the first thing that is typically what I would want to specify when I start my multi-user, if I'm going to do my multi-user options in a group, which is what I'm recommending, is to create groupings of multi-user options instead of alphabetic. Um, and that is, what options am I setting? Am I going to support AD? If this is an AD environment, I would say it's AD. Am I going to run CSS services? Is it a DB environment, et cetera? So again, we see the same sort of list here. It's alphabetic list of the product options. Um, but the one thing is, once you select which options you're going to support in this multi-user, you'll probably be fine. I typically put this at the very front because to me, these are the options that are important because they control what I'm going to run. Um, I won't talk a lot in detail about the options. Basically, you guys know these things like, you know, that server, fast restore, so forth. But this would be my first section. What options am I going to run within this multi-user? The second section now is where I would start putting in the parameters that work for my database. And what you'll see here is something that I put together throughout um, each of these groupings. The green multi-user startup options are the ones that I'm recommending that you have specified. They should be specified in every environment. The blue are the ones I would recommend that you specify. These are ones that I think are important for you to specify and set values for. Now, I understand that a lot of these options would have a default value, and you may be happy accepting the default value. But when someone's reviewing your, your shop and looking at what's there, it might be better for you to actually specify the values so that you can say specifically what you want to run, even if the value you're specifying is the default. So what I have here is, you know, the typical parameters that you would set in the top of every environment to talk about which databases are being accessed, what the break setting is, and so forth. So each of these parameters in green you should have specified. The ones in blue, I would recommend that you consider specifying because they make statements about the processing that even if it defaults, um, it would be better for you to, to make that statement. And you'll see that there are some new ones here. Things like the uh, PSSM muff limit, well, it's easy to say, or the Q per key ID. These guys are new parameters that we've added. And with most new options we've added, we're going to add them in a in a null state, in a no state, so that they don't affect the way your processing is doing. But when you look at these new options, you may want to go out and say, hey, that's a good idea. Q processing per key ID is actually going to be something I need in my environment. So let me set that to yes. Now you want to do this in test, obviously, before you go in and do it in production, but it gives you that opportunity. So I guess what you would say here, the green are the old standbys you've had for, you know, for a long time to, to set. The blue might include some new ones that you haven't seen before that I really think you should investigate and set up to be used with the database environment. Now, what we haven't talked to are the ones over to the right. The ones on the right box here that are in gray are those that are special use. Should you investigate those options and read them, see whether or not you, you really have that special case? Absolutely. But for most sites, the use of these options are not needed. Things like setting your zip user limit, which actually restricts how much zip processing data comp can use, is probably not valuable, especially for a production site. Uh, so what you would do here is just you know read through them, say, yep, I agree, I really don't need these. But I wanted to bring them to light. So these are the parameters that we talk about in the grouping for the database component, basically setting up the basic way the multi-user is gonna work. The next section that I pull out very specifically is logging facility. The logging facility is probably the most important thing about a database. It's great that a database allows you to make changes and do different things and update records and add records, do whatever. But if logging is not set up correctly, you could maybe have a data integrity issue. If the muff crashes, you're going to lose records because you don't have a log facility to back, you know, to actually undo the changes or, or to redo the changes. Um, it may affect performance. If 
block reading is not set up correctly, you could have some options for performance that could actually affect you. So the second thing that I would recommend, second grouping, is specifically state, how is my logging going to work in the environment? And again, we see that the green parameters are typically the parameters you see, and the blue parameters, ones that we recommend that you consider setting. And then finally, there are a lot of options off to the right again that are specific to the use cases. So go through your multi-user and your second group of parameters that we're going to you would set up would be your parameters around the login facility. Now, the next group, you could also just kind of group it together with logging, you don't necessarily have to have a separate group for that, is your RxX or recovery facility settings. So you may want to just say, hey, this is part of the logging recovery group and just include this parameter up. That's probably easier. Probably should have done that way. It'll make it a little simpler for you. But for the, we see here for the recovery processing, which is typically outside of multi-user, we only have a couple parameters that actually need to be specified in the month to say how recovery processing will work. The next one is our compound Boolean selection. Now, CBS could be set up again in that core group with the database startup. I chose to break it out just because uh, CBS is a facility within separate facility within multi-user. It is required by every MUF to be running it. So again, if you want to say, hey, I don't want to have a separate group for CBS, I, I would put this in the database group, that first database, or first group that we saw. And again, CBS just provides our support for the SCLFR commands, which you can either code or is what IDEAL and Data Query use. But it's also the underlying technology for SQL. So the specifications of what you put into CBS can definitely affect the performance for the SQL option. So you want to make sure that you set up these parameters. And again, there's a couple parameters to the right that affect uh, the overall way the CBS works. But most sites won't need those. I would just go with setting up the CBS parameter. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, in most of these cases, I will also tell you that there's ways that you can monitor. So in this case, um, we see that the CBS parameter performance, you can monitor that by looking at this PXX report. The all info report, the MUF shutdown, you know, there's statistics on CBS. It's also available through uh, dynamic testing tables. Uh, and just backing up, um, you'll see in each one of these slides, I've kind of said where we would go for the normal uh, output for these slides. For some reason, my mouse is not moving. This is interesting. It, uh, Okay, so again, we're kind of providing the slides here that you would see. Um, so in each case, we'll talk about what it's used for, what, it's re what it does within the MUF, and then the activity. So stepping backwards, recovery facility is used you know, to set up what we're going to do if you have to a failed event in multi-user and you need to do a recovery. Um, the RX6 rollback parameter is required for every MUF. How would I... Uh, monitor it. There's statistics about this in all the different standard multi-user uh, statistical uh, places. Same thing with CBS. We see it's required for all MOFs, but it's actually monitored using the PXX report, the all info report, MOF shutdown, dynamic testing tools. So moving on, the next group that we broke out is the group that contains the history database facility. Now, I have this in green, and it should be specified. I run across 50% of our sites are still not using the history database. The history database is very important because it does store persistent events, meaning that the information in the history database is there across multi-user cycles. Remember, in the dynamic system tables, the information is only there for the time it takes while MUF is up. But once MUF goes down and you restart MUF, information in the dynamic system tables gets reset. The history database is there so that certain kinds of events, such as the use of sequential processing, how much sequential processing was done in the 24-hour period, um, what types of spills have been done, what are the recovery file names, um, and as we start getting further and further in to release 15.1, we'll be adding more information on utility events. 
So while the history database is not required, it's highly recommended. So we should specify the history of a parameter, which sets that you're going to use the history database, which DBID is going to be, et cetera. So the two parameters we have there that are recommended is the history end hour, which basically tells you whether or not you're going to support or pick the time you want the history information to be written. Um, so that is for the sequential processing events. You know, I typically use it, you know, the default of 2400 or 00, basically saying that we at midnight of every day, we want to record the statistics about uh, sequential processing from the previous day. Um, and then the history event table is a new parameter you need to specify so that you can collect that information on the utility events. Again, we recommend this because even while it doesn't affect your processing within the multi-user, it's a persistent information about what has happened in the past in the multi-user that you can go back and look at. And as time goes on, we'll be using the history database for more and more information. We want to give you as much information as possible about how your multi-user is running and what past events have occurred. The next grouping we get to is the message grouping. Now you notice that I have the echo parameter set here at the top. Well, that would be in the message grouping because it does basically state the messages need to be, you know, certain events in the MUF startup will be echoed to the console. Um, I would maybe break my rule and not put echo in this group specifically. I might put that as a very first line of the MUF startup. Why? Well, once Echo is turned on, then all the other MUF startup options will be echoed to the console. Are they in the MUF sysprint? Of course. But a lot of people look at the console to determine information about the MUF. So having the Echo parameter set that on first, uh, you know, if you put it in this grouping, and this grouping happens to be halfway down, then the MUF console log may not have the options listed that you want. So it's one of the ones that maybe you put outside of the grouping itself, but it is, does deal with the messages. Muff message is very important. I would specify that because it says what we're going to have as the precursor or the, the labels on the front of each of the messages. You may be using those labels for a way of sorting messages in the JEVS log. Um, you may be using it for multiple different reasons. If you don't specify it and the defaults change, it could affect some sort of processing that you set up through automation. Additional messages that we talk about, you know, we recommend things like extent tracking. Uh, message detail G was added um, last year or so. Gives you information on sequential processing. And if you have sequential processing that's not running uh, in a very good performance method uh, and things like HPF. So those are parameters that I would expect or would uh, ask you to put in. I think they'll help you manage your environment. And again, you have a bunch of other messages over to the right, things that you can add into the system to help you uh, do processing. The next group then is the diagnostics. What do you want to have happen if a multi-user fails? Well, in this case, you know, we don't have any that really must be specified, but a couple we would recommend you look at specifying. Specifying what kind of up, down, dump update, yeah, I can say that word, dump output we're doing, and whether or not when we have an add-in, we're going to uh, force a full sample or not. So these are things that we would recommend you set, but you can see here that we don't have any in green that says you have to set. Now, the ones to the right, again, are all special use parameters. We think that clients will you know, certain clients would like some of those and certain clients won't. So these are things that you can uh, research and decide if you want to set. Now, the next grouping is for the accounting facility. Accounting has been around for a very, very long time. To me, it's a very good facility for tests because in a test model, I can uh, set up a lot of accounting tables that show me performance information about applications, and I can use those performance statistics to determine if a change to an application affected its performance, and maybe I shouldn't put it in production. Um, however, accounting has definite overhead. So if you're going to be running accounting in production, you need to make sure that 
the accounting stuff that you're collecting is being used. So don't collect a whole bunch of information that you store in the accounting tables that nobody ever looks at. Um, when you design the accounting tables, and there is a specific way to design the tables, there is a, a science about how you build the accounting tables, you want to collect data in production at the most, the highest level of granularity that you can. Instead of collecting everything the whole way down from um, job to transaction to tape, database to table to command, if you only need information about who's using which database, stop at database. Don't go get that detail level of command, just count up how many times they hit it. So there's things like that when you're in production that if you set an accounting table up incorrectly, it can actually cause performance problems in your environment. Every time I do a site review, I look at the accounting data in production, how much is being collected, how often it's being collected, and I ask very pointed questions. Who's using this data? And if no one tells me they're using this data, I recommend turn it off until someone complains that you're not getting the data they want. Because why create overhead, collect information that no one ever uses? Moving on to the next facility, it's a facility that's optional in our environment. And I would say, from my experience, very few sites actively use, and that's our change capture facility. So we see here that we have nothing in the green or the blue area because um, unless you specifically need change capture to be set up, then this is where you're capturing changes as they occur in a multi-user, storing them off into a change capture database that, that you would then use to forward on to other processing, downstream processing, you don't need to set any of these parameters. If you are going to do change capture processing, then I would recommend that you read through every one of these parameters because they're very specific to how change capture is going to execute and they affect the performance of your environment. If you have change capture running in a multi-user, you could significantly slow down processing if you're capturing more than you need um, and you could affect you know, the amount of data that's being written to the log files all kinds of things can happen to your environment. So while change capture is very necessary in certain environments, you still want to go through every parameter to make sure you understand and you've minimized the overhead for the change capture processing. Now we do have facilities outside of change capture that you can do some basic stuff with, like the DB Utility RxX Analyzer Report, where you could use the RxX. If you're just looking for activity against a certain table, or against a certain database, you may want to just use the RxX Analyzer report and just run it against RxX reports. Um, if you just want to look at um, creating some after-the-fact audit reports about what's happened in your environment, you could use the RxX read process that allows you to, to read the RxX tape and get the changes off the RxX tape. These are after-the-fact, meaning that you know the timing is not going to be instantaneous, um, you're going to have to wait till an RxX tape is created before you can actually analyze it. But if that's all you need, then use those facilities because there's no overhead involved to the user. Where if you need to have the data captured and be available, you know, to be processed downstream immediately, then you can set up the change capture facility. And, you know, I have no problem using it if you have the right needs for it. And the last facility we'll talk about and the optional components, oh, actually there's one more after this one, sorry, but uh, one of the last ones we'll talk about here is a new process. It's very lightly used, but it is available. When we talked about change capture, change capture was focused on the ability to capture changes. So what gets written to the change capture database is gonna be all the updates, deletes, and adds. Well, in some very specific cases, customers need to know if data has been read, not changed, but has someone read it? And if they did read it, who read it? Now, this is a very, um, I won't call it a slippery slope, but a very, very concerning one to me because most of the shops I see when I work with Datacom, probably 90, and 95% of the activity in the database environment is read. So if you change and turn on data access capture, where you're capturing every time someone does a read, you know, there's gonna be a lot of overhead compared to 
when we do the change capture facility where we're capturing all the time only when they make a change. So in a change capture facility where they make a change, we basically have this ability, um, you know, where you're capturing what 5% of the workload maybe. Um, so one of the things that I'm recommending here is that if you are going to look at data access capture, and again, it's a very unique situation where you need to know who has accessed or read a data record, not who's updated it. The only place that information is going to be available is going to be in one of two places, an accounting table where you're actually watching every um, program and looking at what commands are being issued or in the data access um, capture facility. Uh, what you do with the data access capture facility is basically, hopefully, have a very restricted set of tables that you have to keep track of. And what will happen is, as someone reads one of those tables, we'll store specific information about what record, what master key ID was read by that person, and we store that on the log file so that you can process it after the fact. As I said, you know, if you just need certain information about what's going on or who's reading a table, you might be better off using the accounting facility because it's probably going to be a higher or a lower, it'll let you do a higher level of granularity, which means you have a lower uh, impact on the system. So data access capture was created for a very specific need for certain sites, it's required and you need to have it. But if there is not that specific need or you could use a higher level capture like an accounting facility, I would definitely recommend using that. So in this case, we're saying data capture is a, an optional component that you most likely won't specify. The last, the component here that we definitely would specify, we recommend for everybody, is the SQL component. And again, when I broke these out, I didn't break them out in, in importance. Maybe I should reorganize the slides in a future presentation. And, and you know, obviously SQL would move up to right after database because we believe SQL is important for every site. Um, the SQL component basically is recommended for every site. The green options again set the SQL, what we would say are required options. The blue are relatively new options that you can use to add to help the performance of SQL. You can make decisions about how queries are cached, uh, how much memory can we use for hashing, et cetera. Those are the parameters we would, we would recommend that you specify in that SQL grouping. Now, again, while you can run multi-user without SQL, we, because of the world we're in, the openness and all the things we need to do, we find that we definitely recommend that every shop should be running SQL. And one of the things about SQL is just the point there that SQL does require the CVS facility. Now, again, on the right of this slide are a number of options that you can specify to uh, make specific site-specific changes to how or what you're collecting. So green, you should specify for sure. Blue, I recommend you specify. Gray, read them, see if you think it's something you need, and then add it from there. The final component that we have here is the STAR component. Datacom STAR is a product that has been stabilized. It provides distributed database, database access across uh, multiple databases or across multiple MOSs at the same time. Uh, we've replaced much of the STAR processing with the Datacom multi uh, MUF processing option, as well as the Datacom table partitioning option. So we would not recommend anyone who is not using STAR currently to start using STAR. This is something we think most people need to get off of. Um, there is a definite overhead if you turn STAR on. Uh, every request that goes into the multi-user is looked at to see if it participates in the STAR event, which adds overhead. Um, so again, while it's here, it's a component that could be used, we do not recommend it be turned on. And there are other facilities you might consider instead, like multi-MUF for distributing requests across multiple multi-users, or table partitioning when you have to partition a table. So that gets us in to the last grouping we want to cover, which are the buffer pool groupings. These are your performance options as far as um, how the multi-user should go. So while all those previous groupings we talked about are pretty much ones that we'll set and forget, I don't, know, I, I don't want to say set and forget, but 
you know, we'll set and we pretty much won't make any changes to those unless there's something specific changing in the way our environment works. Um, these are ones that we will definitely look at and monitor and make changes to regularly. First one is the standard buffer pools. So we have basically standard buffer pools that have been used since both these are started. These are the buffer pools that manage all the processing for all the databases out there unless you specify the database should be treated special. So by default, pretty much every access you have is going to go through one of the standard buffer pools. Um, the first buffer pool we have is the syspool buffer pool. It sets up the CXX, the IXX, and the DXX buffers. Um, the buffers are set up um, to a specific block size for the IXX and DXX blocks. The majority of the sites run 4K. You have an ability to run an 8K, but very few people use it. And I've not seen anyone that really felt that having a bigger than a 4K uh, IXX or DXX buffer has been a, a big performance for them. You can decide uh, by default, these are in 64-bit. I wouldn't know why you'd put them to 31-bit, um, but you can tell us the, the pool or the where the memory should be allocated. And then finally, you can choose to have these uh, buffer pools in what's called the large frame fixed area. It's a performance options available for the newer Xeos operating systems. If you have the large frame areas available, um, it is something that you can do to make the performance better. One of the things here that I want to focus on is years past, we've been very careful about allocating buffers because they use 31 bit memory. We were very concerned about how much memory we had left. Uh, etc. That's not the case with 64-bit memory. Most shops have a significant amount of 64-bit memory and being stingy on buffer pools uh, affects performance of MUF and doesn't really um, provide any benefit to the system when we already have all this memory available. So, you know, while I'm saying, you know, I'm basically I'm saying don't be too restrictive in sizing these guys. You know, in the old days, we might have started out with 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, you know, or 20 CXX and 1,000 DXX and 2,000, uh, I'm sorry, 1,000 IXX and 2,000 DXX. In today's world, 64 bit memory, it's much more reasonable to start out with something like 20,000 IXX and 50,000 DXX. You know, set up reasonable buffer pools. I will tell you, most of the other mainframe databases have already moved to a position where they don't even do this anymore. They just go grab gigabytes. So, yeah, we're very careful about our resources. We want you to be careful about resources. We know that's one of the values of data commons that you can build a data common environment that fits the size that you need. But let's not be too restrictive. Let's not keep ourselves uh, in this environment. So we see here, for example, at the top, uh, we have 20 CXX buffers. Typically, that's enough for any shop. That just handles open and closed processing. And then we see that I have 20,000 uh, IXX and 50,000 DXX. Well, if you calculate that out, that's only 274 megabyte of 64-bit memory. And if you go to the 40,000, 90,000, that's a whole 508 megabytes. And if I max out those two poles, the 99,000, 99, um, it's 782 megabytes. So basically, if we max the pools out, I'm not telling people to go right to 99, you know, start with the 2050. Um, even at the maxed out size, so it's less than a gigabyte of memory. And again, we have the, the standard options for doing the tuning. Um, you know, how many often, how often do we use a buffer one time versus using it five or more times? And those options are all available for PXX reports and other uh, multi user statistical uh, environments. So the second standard buffer pool is the data pool. Now, the data pool is where we find typically happen to have larger data pools. And this is very dependent upon what we call the working set size. In a given 10 minute period, how many different data blocks is the multi-user accessing? We wanna keep all those data blocks um, that are re-accessed in, in the memory, in the buffer pools. So typically we try to have a large buffer pool here. However, we gotta remember with the data pools sizes, um, you know, these are bigger buffers, you know, in the, um, what we have is called the data pool one or data no. Um, basically, this will handle all 
requests for all tables to have a block size that's less than or equal to the data length. The second pool, which is what we call the large buffer pool, basically is for handling bigger blocks, uh, and that will handle everything that's above the data pool one or data length, but equal to or less than the data pool two data length. If you have something bigger than the data pool two data length, then you're going to have to have a special, uh, special buffer pool to handle that. We'll talk about that on the next slide. But we see over here to the right that you know a typical data pool startup, if you use the 4K data size and the maximum 28K data size, uh, which would be like half track locking, what we see here is that even at a 40K, uh, 40,000 of the 4K and 20,000 of 28K, we're going to use about 2.75 gigabytes of space. If we get really large and we have 80,000 of the four and 40,000, um, you get 5.5. And again, if we max it out, you could be at like 12.5 gigs. The idea here is again, 64 bit memory, there's a lot of it, you know, terabytes of it. You probably don't have terabytes available in your shop, I understand. But 30 or 40 gigabytes of space is most likely available. So using a data pool that's sized to fit your environment is um, probably the best way to improve performance. Now we also have uh, the flexible pool, flexible pool and data pool, are, and you know basically all the flexible is it says I didn't want to set my standard sys pool, my standard data pool, at the maximum size, so I set it at, at what I thought I needed, and then I'm going to set flex pool up with in this example, 10 buffers each. And if MUF is running, and I see that I could use more of those standard buffers, those just pool buffers or uh, data pool buffers, I could dynamically allocate more buffers by upping the flex pool count. So this basically just added on to the top of the specifications for sys pool and uh, data pool. I recommend most shops specify flex pool with a number like 10 just so that you have it set up so that if there is a chance that multi-user needs to have more buffers in your syspool or your data pool and you don't have the ability to shut them off down and change those parameters you can dynamically up the flexible number up to the total of 999 for the specific pool that you're changing so again flexible doesn't let you have more syspool buffers or more data pool one data pool two buffers it just lets you set that as that a number under the max size and then you can use flexible to move it up and down while MUF is running now the next is what we call the user defined buffer pools these are not your standard buffer pools these are buffer pools that work much like the ixx dxx and data pools we talked about syspool and data pool except that you're going to specify these buffer pools specifically for a given database or database set of databases. Um, works the same way. You have a maximum number of buffers in these pools of 99,999. They are additional pools, so they are additional memory, um, and they are not shared with a syspool or data pool parameters. This is an extra one you're setting up. Typically, I'm going to set these um, user-defined buffer pools up for Maybe I have a database with a data area. I went with 4K and 28K, and for some reason I've got one data area or one database of 8K data buffers. And you know, I know that if I use 8K, it will fit into the 28K, so it will work, but it won't actually be making the maximum use of those performance. So I'll set up a special buffer pool just for that one data area or database. Maybe I've done my syspool and I've gotten my syspool parameters up to 99,999, and I still don't feel like I have enough buffers to handle all the indexes going on in my shop. I can set up an additional um, user-defined buffer pool for those index buffers, or index and DXX buffers. But if I do set one of those guys up, I will have to selectively pick which databases I want to use the standard pool, or in a different way, pick which databases use the user-defined buffer pool and let all the other databases uh, defer to or default to the standard pools. So 
Um, I usually use user-defined buffer pools to handle exceptional databases, things that are outside the norm, um, to give specific processing uh, requirements to a, data, a specific database that has some sort of problem about it or some performance expectation. <coughs> Um, or in the maximum case where you don't think your standard pools are big enough, you could create one of these pools and split your processing out. Now, the one thing that we're noting here is we added a new feature, which is called the buffer pools by area for index and buffer pools by area for data. This is a new type of buffer pool. It's just been as the system recently. We've had some recent presentations around this at the MTE. Um, we are starting to see clients adopt this and use this. What I see these special buffer pools, the buffer pool index, buffer pool data for, is to use processing that is, uh, use these to handle what I call dominant processing. What we have noticed is if you are shop, as a data process, you know, a data area, index area, and you're monitoring statistics and you notice that this index and data area might be 50, 60, 70% of the total activity in that multi-user. You know, it's 70% of the IO is going through this one data set. It's going to dominate your buffer pools. If it's in the standard pools, basically it's going to be so active that it throws everybody else out of the standard pools and you're, you have this dominant database processing. Now, in the past, we would try to help it to reduce the I.O. We would basically cover the data set to try to get the data in memory and therefore at least reduce the overhead of doing all that physical read activity. So we reduce the read I.O. But when we cover it, it does not remove the tendency for that heavy use data set that dominate the buffer pools because a covered area allows you to cache the data or the index, but it doesn't use, it still has to use the standard pools, the buffer pools to manage those requests. So while we're saving a lot of the physical IO by covering it, we didn't remove the fact that this one activity is dominating our buffer pools. And when it dominates our buffer pools, it could make other applications slow down because they have to fight for buffers that this guy is consuming faster than they can consume. So the idea of the buffer pool by index and buffer pool by data is to allocate space that handles this dominant processing. Now here's the key to the, why these are different than the buffer pool, the, the user defined buffer pools we talked on the previous page. The buffer pools by area buffer pool index, buffer pool data, can actually exceed the 99,000 buffer limit. These guys can have 300,000, you know, a million buffers, whatever it is that you can allocate. Now, these buffer pools by area will only be allocated in 64-bit memory. You cannot allocate these in 31-bit memory. And as such, you can create significantly large buffer pools that handle your dominant processing, make them perform much better, they get all the benefits of like what you get with covered of the same size, but you're also isolating them away from your standard pool so you don't have that domination of the pools. So what we recommend here is for those sites that can identify up to 10 specific data areas or indexes that have high dominant processing rates, and I would say rates well over 20%, you could make those their own buffer pool by index, buffer pool by data setting, and allow that to basically handle those buffer pools, have them sized as big as what you would do for covered, but you would get the efficiency of a buffer pool. They would still be resident in memory, so you reduce the I.O. You don't need to cover them anymore, and you isolate them away from um, the other processing so you can actually control how fast and how much you want to give to these dominant processes. Now, again, these are limited 10 specifications per month. So buffer pool by index, buffer pool by data is not intended to be used across all your different things. It's when you can identify that on your normal processing, there's two or three data areas that amount to 80% of your or index areas. 
80% of your physical processing, you might consider using these instead of using the covered areas. And then the last grouping we want to talk about is the virtual covered. <clears throat> so virtual is still very much needed. Virtual is used for all of our non-persistent data sets. Typically, those are system data sets, uh, CBS index, the IXX for 17, the TTM file for 17. Um, some clients I have come across have uh, virtual specifications for user data. It's user data that's only needed during the multi-user session. You create the data, you use the data, and if multi-user happens, you don't care because the data is not there anymore. So with the virtual specifications, we basically still see this as being something that you would definitely use, even though you have buffer, buffer pools by area, because these are specifically targeted towards those temporary uh, use data sets of non-persistent data sets. And the key to this is virtual databases is there's no processing at all. We don't IO anything to load it. Even with buffer pools, um, the buffer pool by area, we still need to do the initial IO to get those buffers loaded. Here, we're not doing any of it's basically all done in memory. The one thing to note over here is that while we have the virtual parameters, we also specify the uh, covered max size two gig. The default for your covered max size is two gig, um, but I like to specify that so I know exactly what how big any of my virtual or covered specifications can be. So I do recommend specifying. And then the final section we'll cover here is the memory resident data facility for covered data. This is persistent data that does get processed through the standard buffer pools, but, or even a, a user defined buffer pool, but is also backed up by when you read a block, that block's also copied to 64 uh, bit memory as a cache. Now, there is an option to use 31 bit memory here, but I would recommend that it is something that occurs in shops that, that does not do not have available 64-bit memory. <clears throat> and again, if you're only using 31-bit memory, you're probably very limited on how much you can get to cover in there. Um, prior to buffer pool by area, this was how we handled dominant processing. We would take the busiest data sets and we would cache them. That did not remove the fact that we were dominating the buffer pools but what it did say is when we have to grab something from these guys, we could grab it from the cache memory versus having to do another I.O. to DASD. So if a block got used, <clears throat> got dumped out of the buffer because the buffer had to be used for something else, when we go to grab the block the second time, we get it from the covered memory. So I'm still a big believer in the covered processing, but what I will tend to do is use the buffer pools by area for the two or three data sets that have that um, dominant effect. And then for those other data sets where I want to get reduce the I.O. Um, and I have available 64-bit memory, I could actually use covered. So it's buffer pools by area isn't replacing covered, but it's replacing maybe the first few data sets that you would normally cover. So with that, let's talk a little bit about where we go from here. <clears throat> so one of the things that we want to open up a discussion and have with the clients over the next few months is how we deliver these options. As we can see that there's many, many options and we've added, you know, many, you know, when continuous delivery came out, we've been adding these options so that you can add new features in uh, and be able to use them, but on a controlled fashion. So we know that we're going to have to add new options. But every new option we add means that you have to increase your knowledge. You have to be able to go read the option, decide what to set. Um, we try to reduce how much we are asking you to learn in order to set these new options, but there will be more information. You know, you do need to do some research. What we're talking about doing in short term is to look at a lot of the options that are being specified and say, of all these old options, can we kind of maybe get rid of some of these? Are some of these no longer really, you know, with the bigger systems, the newer architectures, the higher level processors, and amount of 64 bit memory? Do these parameters still make sense to ask somebody to set them? And if we can get rid of, for every new parameter we add, if we can get rid of two old parameters you don't need anymore, that would be great because this session next year could be done in a half hour instead of an hour. 
Um, so what we're looking to do short term is look at what parameters can be ignored and we can basically deprecate them and you don't have to specify them anymore. You know, eventually they're initially going to be ignored and eventually we'll say, hey, please remove these because they don't mean anything. Um, also, we're always looking at the default settings and seeing if the default settings no longer fit um, the current platforms. Anytime we make any change of this type, we're going to flag it. We're going to tell you that we made this change, that we ignored the setting because it's no longer usable. So we'll get those messages in the MUF output as part of your best practice messages. In the midterm, beyond just the, the easy cleanup, you know, the low hanging fruit, we're going to start looking at data from users and see what non-optimal selections have been done and where performance problems have been noticed and start looking at are there ways where we can actually have the multi-user set, you know, maybe a higher default or you know, correct the setting for the user in order to give you a more optimal setting. Uh, again, anytime we would do that, we would have a best practice message. And then finally, the long term. You know, long term, our goal is for you to set the goals of the multi user. I would like my multi user to get maximum efficiency within this amount of 31 bit space, this amount of 64 bit space and then let us handle which pool should be set up, what should be a buffer pool by area, you know, what's the dominant processing, because it could change over time. So as your goal for the month is always the same, you want maximum processing within 20 gigabyte and 64 bit memory, we could shift the buffer pools around and what we allocate where to get the, better, the best performance for that multi-user with that goal of memory. So with that, we're going to go into questions and answers. Do we have any questions out there? Has anything come in? Thanks, Kevin. We know, actually, at this point, we don't have any questions. So if you, if you want to move okay. to the polls, we, we can definitely do that. Yeah, we'll do that. Um, just remote, remember, guys, if you have a question, feel free at kevin.schuma at broadcom.com or reach out to support or any of our, our core technicians. Obviously, we all love to talk to you. So let's go to the pools. So here's the first poll that we have out there, Lynn. I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thanks, Kevin. I'm going to go ahead and launch it now. When was the last time you changed your production MUF startup options? Please select one of the options. And as always with these polls, it takes a few seconds for the poll to distribute. Looks like it's still being sent to everybody. All right, people are starting to respond. Let's say another 10 to 15 seconds. All right, thank, thank you very much for that one. And then our next poll, I'll launch that one as well. Which are using which are you using in production? And for this one, please select all that apply. And while, while folks are filling, are filling out that poll, we actually do have a question, Kevin. Uh, okay. How can we tell if a base slash area is dominating the buffer pools? For example, is a candidate for buffer pool index and buffer pool data? Well, one of the things that I do is typically um, I look at the statistics in um, the table we call MFA, basically the area statistics. And if you have a tool like um, AutoCollect, which you can actually look, you know, where you can actually set, um, where you can actually just snapshot in the beginning of a, of a specific key period like the day shift or whatever and snapshot at the end but what i do is i look at um, the area statistics to see and i make sure i actually have a query that does it for me but i add in any mrdf activity and i look for what areas or indexes have the most physical io and that would be io that is either physical io or io that the mrdf covered for me 
but look at those areas and determine which are the ones that get the highest IO activity. IO activity is directly related to a buffer being loaded. <clears throat> the database is going to do a thousand IOs, and if it's doing a thousand IOs, that's going to hit a thousand different buffers. And what I've seen at the last couple of shops I looked at, really surprisingly, that during key processing periods, you might find one data set that's as high as, and I've seen this, as high as 75% of all IO activity. So during that key processing period, 75% of the IO, which is driven directly to replacing a data block or a data buffer, is through one specific data set. So that's what I do, what I use. I look for dominant processing by looking at the multi-user um, statistics around area and area IOs. But you also have to remember if you happen to have that data set covered, you have to add in any of those IOs that would have been done if the cover hadn't been there. Um, a second thing you can do then once you've kind of selected that subset is then look at your uh, MFT or your table statistics to also see if it correlates to the number of database requests that are being done against the tables in that specific area. Typically that just shows the same exact data. If it doesn't, then you're looking at some act and you know, we have to look at, and please feel free to reach out, look at the differences and try to make sure that there's not maybe something going on in the background we didn't see. But I start with a query that accesses the MFA data, the area statistics data, about physical IOs, and I make sure I add in any IOs that were MRDF. Okay, Lynn, any other questions? Thanks, Kevin. That's actually the, the only question I, I see, and we are uh, actually just past the top of the hour, so we want to respect everyone's time. With that in mind, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, keep an eye out in the Datacom community for the for the, the replay of today's session, and also keep an eye out for our for our, our, our webcast calendar, which which I'll be which I'll be updating probably sometime next week into 2023. We are going to continue our monthly session. So that we're looking forward to that. Have a great rest of your week and a great weekend, and we'll talk to you next time. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, everybody.